I don't know how the hell you got past me, I said. Capone came walking over to my car all bloody. Somebody must have hit him with a bottle. Police were pulling up. So he took his bloodstained shirt off, wiping the blood off his face with it and tossing it to me before the cops saw him. I threw it into the bushes and gave him a fresh t-shirt from the car while more gunshots were fired from the pit. My cousin Stobo and his girl ran over and we jumped into the car and pulled off. On the way back to drop Capone off in the projects, we drove past this kid Moan from QB pedaling fast down the side of the Grand Central Parkway on an NYPD mountain bike. In the Shook Ones video, Moan was riding in the passenger seat while I'm driving the Saab across the 59th Street Bridge. He must have grabbed the bike while the cops were cuffing everybody and made a smooth getaway amid all the excitement. This nigga's on the Grand Central Parkway riding an NYPD mountain bike. Wow. Later that night, we crashed to Hempstead. Money Knows, Stobo, and I were sitting around my kitchen table talking and watching the news when clips of the survival of the fittest video flashed on the TV screen. Then, footage of all the bullet holes and cars at the pier parking lot and the shell casings on the ground. The news reporter called it an infamous boat ride. We were open. Our yacht party actually made the news. A couple of the dudes who got their heads cracked open with that pole tried to sue us for their hospital bills and pain and suffering a few months later. Niggas kill me. They act thug. And then when they get whooped out, they try to sue you? Shit is pathetic. A month after that yacht party, we did a show at some small club on West 20th Street in Manhattan called 20 West. Another new group, the Lost Boys from Jamaica, Queens, was also on the bill to perform. They were supposedly some gang who started rapping and had a semi-hit record called Lifestyles of the Rich and Shameless. Of course, the whole 12th Street crew came with us. Even if we didn't invite them, the whole hood would show up and get mad if everybody couldn't get in. I never understood that. If nobody invited you, how could you be mad if you can't get in? I was extra drunk. Some girl climbed onto the stage and was dancing in front of me while I was performing. Who the fuck is this jumping on the stage acting like a fool? I felt that she was disrespecting our show. So I kicked in her back and she went flying into the crowd. I kicked the shit out of her. I was bugged out back then. A big muscle-bound bouncer was standing in front of the stage ice grilling me. He must have been upset because I kicked that girl. After the last song, I jumped off stage and punched him in his mouth. He started pounding on me. I was so drunk, I didn't even feel his punches. My man Bumpy from QB helped me fight him. And then more bouncers surrounded us. Next thing I knew, all the bouncers were jumping us. Knocked to the floor, I looked up and they were carrying Bumpy up in the air while dragging me outside by my shirt. They dropped Bumpy on his head and pushed me to the curb. After that, we tore that club up, all 30 of us. We broke the windows and all the mirrors behind the bar. As we was walking back to the train station to go home, we saw like 40 dudes walking towards us from the 23rd Street train station two blocks away, loudly chanting, Lost boys, lost boys. So we started chanting, Mob deep. Queens Bridge and it was inevitably about to be a Royal Rumble already hyper from the club we walked straight up to them Capone set it off pulling out a razor and cutting the closest nigga across the face niggas was getting stabbed hit with metal garbage cans no gunfire though a police riot squad pulled up suddenly we all stopped fighting each other and started fighting the cops so we wouldn't get arrested Garbage cans was flying. Some of the Lost Boys got stabbed. Everybody fighting everybody. And someone started swinging the long blue wooden police barricade. Having a bunch of us ran to the train. But a lot of niggas got locked up that night. On a train ride home, two white boys were standing on the platform with bloody faces. They said that a bunch of black dudes had just jumped them and cut their faces up. Wow, well, everybody was wilding that night. Now that I think about it, 
It might have been the Lost Boys. To this day, my people from Jamaica tell me they heard about that fight. Some say they saw the Lost Boys come home all bloody that night. It sounds like a scene from a movie, but it was real. Steve Rifkin informed us that we were banned from performing in Manhattan for two years after that 20 West show. We were getting into too many fights and destroying clubs, so somebody with power banned us. We never found out who it was, but that bullshit ban didn't stop us. We were still doing shows worldwide. Our music was on fire all over the map. We didn't know our music would affect people's lives the way it did. It made us work hard to keep that feeling going. We saw people dressing like us, talking like us, even drinking like us. They tried to make beats and rap like us. A lot of people started using infamous and attaching it to their name. I wasn't feeling that. Get your own shit. Get off of my pole. Even Biggie started calling himself the Notorious after that. Hmm. I wonder where you got that out there from. Chapter six. Chapter six. Chapter six. Hell on earth. 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 The storeboard rap ain't shit. My category is that of an insane man who strike back. I draw first blood. It's over with, and that's that. God part three. Life was hectic when we were young. The night after the 20 West brawl, the whole 12th Street crew was on the block drinking, smoking, joking, and playing dice. A chick from the hood came walking by with a dude who wasn't from QB. He was a slut everybody ran through, so the crew started calling her over. She came, and my man Karate Joe met her halfway. The dude she was with didn't look too happy about this and kept his distance. Joe spoke to Shorty for a while, and the kid got frustrated and told the girl to hurry up. Yo, mind your business. Joe looked over and told him. The kid said something slick back to Joe, and about five of my boys responded by walking over toward him. The kid acted like he had heart, walked over to us, and exchanged more words. Then the kid reached in his pants and pulled out a gun. But he was so nervous that he dropped it on the ground between him and Joe. Everybody paused. Joe looked down like he wanted to reach for the gun, but it was closer to the kid. The kid reached down quick, picked it up, and A1 hauled ass. Had ran top speed into a pole and bust his forehead open. I wanted to run from the bench where I was sitting next to the kid, but I couldn't because I was too close. He'd definitely shoot me if he sees me get up and run. So I just sat there. He squeezed the trigger at my boys, but the gun was jammed from being dropped. He scrambled to fix it. And looked over at me and pointed the gun in my face. My adrenaline was going crazy. I wanted to run or duck, but something told me just to be still. The kid started squeezing the trigger towards my face, but the gun still didn't work. So he ran out the projects. Everybody came back to the benches. Yo, why you ain't run? My boy's asked. He was too close. If I ran, I would have been the last one, I said. I would have been the one shot in the back. After we laughed it off, I went upstairs to lie down because my sicker cell was acting up. I thought I was about to get shot in my face. Shit. I thought I was about to die. I took about six Advil and went to sleep in Hazard's room. After a few hours, loud shouts from outside woke me up. When I looked out the window, the 12th Street niggas was beefing with some niggas from another block. Some tall dude kicked Noy in the chest and knocked him down. Karate Joe walked over and everybody backed up. Nobody wanted to fight Joe. He was a boxer and he knew karate. He and Yammy were our secret weapons. The argument spilled on the 10th Street. And from the window, I had the best seat in the house. Trip. A.K.A. Godfather chased some guy around the car 20 times with a knife. Noy cut someone across the face with a razor. The next afternoon, the nigga who Noy cut shot Noy three times on 12th Street, right next to the hill. Bullets in his leg, arm, and middle finger. Noy wanted us to put out his solo album, but we didn't have our own label or money 
to sign and promote him properly. We told him to have patience and it would happen soon, but he didn't listen. He got Karate Joe to manage him and they started shopping for a deal without telling us. We were upset, but Noid explained that he had bills to pay and couldn't wait around for us to get a label deal. We understood and we let him go. After Noy got shot up, fans, radio stations, and magazines were all talking about it, amazed that we were living the life that we were rapping about. Feeling all that fake love from people boosted Noy's ego and made him want to be a star on his own. You know how that story goes. Like when 50 Cent first came out and nobody gave a shit until he got shot and almost died. Fake love. A few months later, Noy landed a deal at Tommy Boy Records. He helped him with the production. He dropped episodes of A Hustler and sold a disappointing 30,000 copies. But the streets loved Noy. It could have been way bigger than it was. The original plan was for Havoc and me to convince Steve Rifkin to give us our own label, Infamous Records, and sign Noy and the whole crew, the twins, Ty Nitty, Godfather, and Gotti, plus Chinky, a female R&B singer who was Harlem Hustler Alpo's niece. No one had patience, and we all needed money, so we split up with separate plans. Havoc and I were mad annoyed, though. Mob Deep was responsible for making him a star, so he should have stuck it out with us. Right after Noy's album was released, he got locked up for shooting his kid three times in the stomach for messing with his baby moms. It happened right in front of his building in Queensbridge, and the police were looking for him. I told him to dye his head blonde and wear a fake nose ring for a disguise. We all laughed at that one. It wasn't funny when Noy got caught and sentenced to a one to three year bid. Tommy Boy dropped Noy. We kept his name alive by performing his verse from Give Up the Goods at all the shows. Yo, it's the R A Double P E R N O Y D. Niggas can't fuck with me. The crowd chanted his verse along with us word for word. In August 1995, the Source magazine hosted the second annual Source Awards at Madison Square Garden. We were cool with the owners of the magazine, so we got a bunch of tickets and the whole crew went. I even brought Kiki. I'd always tell her that it was too dangerous to come out with me, but I wanted to bring her along and make her feel good. We all got drunk and high and went inside and took our seats. Havoc and I were presenting the war with Wu-Tang Clan so we kicked it backstage with them in the dressing room. Hav was so bent that he fell asleep on the floor. Kiki and I walked back to our seats to watch the show. In the middle of Biggie's performance, Hav came into the crowd screaming, Somebody took my fucking chain, yo! Somebody fucking robbed me, son! We jumped up to help him find his chain. Come to find out, Raekwon saw Havoc drunk on the floor in the dressing room and took his chain off his neck so nobody else would snatch it. Ray pulled it out of his pocket and gave it back to Hav, and we all calmed down. Death Row hit the stage and did one of the illest shows ever. Their stage setup had jail cells that opened up one by one as they performed Stranded on Death Row. After the song, Snoop Dogg started screaming on the mic. New York ain't got love for Snoop Doggy Dog. New York ain't got love for Death Row. I sat there wondering, what the fuck is he talking about? He was really feeling himself because of all the money and power they were displaying on stage. But he took it a little bit too far. All the hooping and hollering made Snoop sound real stupid and left a sour taste with everybody from New York. After Death Row was done, Mob Deep and Wu-Tang hit the stage to present an award. When we went back to our seats, Suge Knight, the co-founder and CEO, all the hooping and hollering made Snoop sound real stupid and left a sour taste with everybody from New York. After Death Row was done, Mob Deep and wu 